So when you have the halo and you're about to shake it, is there any kind of preamble or is there any kind of talk before the match of how many shakes you're going to do or you're just yes. going to do it once? Oh, there is. Okay. So what's the, what's the talk? You're going to shake it a few times or, or how does it go? Because it seems like you're really in the moment. You shake it a couple times. The crowd just literally um, is about to gasp. Yeah, in my recollection, uh, we had spoken about, you know, because, you know, keep in mind, he's legitimately still screwed into this thing, you know, so it's not like, you know, he can just sort of go, to this day, I, I say, and I will to my dying breath, had Gary taken a flat back wrestling bump on that when I threw him down, I think it would have killed it. You know, I think it was still going to some heat at that moment. But in the long run, and watching that play back, I think most fans would say, ah, something looks familiar here. It's a flat back bump. And instead, because he's locked into that contraption. Uh, now, sidebar, what the fans, most fans at that moment didn't realize was that Gary was supposed to have the halo taken off the week before. And we had this upcoming ECW arena show, and Paul called him and said, hey, you know, if you can keep it on for an extra week, it'd be fantastic. And I'm, you'd have to ask Gary. I don't know if Paul ever explained to him what he had planned that night. But, uh, yeah, we had talked about the number of throws. And so I'm very clearly in my head counting out the one, two, three, four, five when I would l release them. Uh, but then from that moment, like from the moment I grabbed the halo, if you watch my face, you'll go me from being in character to throwing him down and then trying to digest and decipher what the crowd's response is. And if you watch it in slow motion, frame by frame, you'll see me go from the franchise fangs out, fuck you fans, to this sort of quizzical, like, where are we? This is strange. And then when the fans start pouring over the railing, like the yikes look on my face. Uh, you know, it was a very fast trajectory that we went from that to that, uh, you know, but, you know, I knew Gary was fine, right? you know, first and most importantly, I knew Gary was fine because, you know, we had timed it out so carefully and, uh, you know, up to that point, everything is as planned out beforehand. It wasn't until the fans started jumping the rail that I don't, think I knew I hadn't conceived of, you know, I'm just wrestling in front of a group of wrestling fans that get this. And I don't think Gary could have conceived of it. I know Paul Hammond didn't conceive of it. Contrary to whatever he tells you, I knew this and I knew that. I know he didn't plan on that. You know, that that's, you can't plan on that kind of reaction in a wrestling audience, what we call white heat. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, it's like the white rhino, you know, he exists. Supposedly you hear somebody that talked to somebody that talked to somebody that talked to somebody that saw it, but trust me, it's real. Uh, same thing in wrestling. When you hear the term white heat, you know, you, you hear a story in the locker room from somebody that heard it from somebody that heard it from somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody and it's real. Um, it wasn't until that moment in my career, the yikes moment, that I realized, holy shit, this is a real thing, and this ain't good. You know, you're you're in a, I don't care how tough you are or how strong you are or how proficient you are at your craft. When you're in a room of 1,100 plus people shoehorned into that building, and every single one of them wants to get their hands on you to tear you to pieces. And you've also, by the way, got a hundred pound beauty queen laying ringside face down that has no idea any of this is going on. It's a pretty damn scary moment. You know, it, it, it uh, today sitting here talking about it, I can talk about it with pride that it worked the way that we hoped it had. But in that moment, I don't think if you said, I'll give you a million dollars to do it again in that exact moment that I would do it because honest to God, I didn't know that I was going to get out of the arena one piece. Uh, it was terrifying. And the most terrifying moment of that exit from the building when those 
two guys in full riot gear, helmets and you know, bulletproof vests and shoulder pads and everything came around that corner. When I saw Tommy Dreamer looking out from the dressing room, holding the curtains back, and I saw the look on his face, uh, my heart sunk to my toes. Because I thought, I'm not getting home alive. Uh, I'm in trouble here. That, that was the look that Tommy Dreamer, I saw on Tommy Dreamer's face, sheer terror. And I wasn't about to turn around and see the, the barrel of a gun to the back of my head. That's what, that's what I thought. Like, there's somebody's got a gun, somebody's got a chainsaw, somebody's got something vicious to the back of my head. And that's why Tommy's looking like that. As I'm trying to drag Francine's feet up underneath her, you know, next to me, I'm dragging her along like my school books. Uh, a terrifying moment, a really terrifying moment, and one that I would choose not to relive if I didn't have to. It was a riot, which is crazy because those fans are considered to be, you know, the quote unquote smarter fans, and they're supposedly think they know where everything is going, or you know, they say inside terms. They they feel like they know the booking, or they know uh, what's going to yeah. happen next, and they can figure it out. So is it almost even more of white heat? It's almost like you tricked the the tricksters there, and you even got over on the smartest of fans. So, and, and you know, and caused a riot. So that's almost like a double whammy. Well, tr- I mean, truth be known, again, and this is not, you know, you know, calling something that, something it's not. Th- those fans in that building by that point in 1996 had seen some of the most cutting edge at that time angles in wrestling uh, uh, history. I mean, these were, especially in America, these were things that you might have read something similar, something in the same vein from Mexico or from Japan, somewhere else, but never in America. And suddenly here on our back doorstep, uh, you know, where the Liberty Bell sits, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is this insanity going on and those fans had seen everything they had seen brian lee take a bump off of a swinging scaffold 40 feet above the the ring uh they had seen terry funk and, and mick foley set people on fire they had seen terry funk and sabu battle out to where terry funk was literally entombed in barbed wire uh these fans had seen everything but I just stated and everything in between, they had seen it all. If there were a smart mark on the planet at that time, it was these 1100 fans. And yet they reacted that way. You know, they, and I, uh, the only way I can ever sort of gauge it out in my head is that they were always trying, you know, if you always try to outthink the thinker, Sometimes you might get right, you might get close, and sometimes you're going to be off by a million miles. Uh, it's just a question that you believe that you're thinking the same way he thinks, in this case, Paul Hammond, but you're just a little bit smarter. Uh, clearly, in that moment, nobody in that building had an inkling of what Paul Hammond was thinking. Nobody had an inkling of what Gary and I had planned. And they reacted viscerally. Uh, they let their guts get the better of them. And the television that it created, the footage that it created, was golden. You know, again, not somebody want to relive at that moment, but from a wrestling point of view, the footage that that created, the reaction of the fans, not just in their gasps or in their fangs or in their reaction. Uh, it was far beyond anything that any of us could have hoped for. Uh, thank God nobody got killed in the process, namely a certain guy that likes to wear black and gold. <laughs> it's, hmm. It was pretty scary. Uh, 